Okay, so we're going to get back into the message series that we're on, on spiritual violence. It's so appropriate, I believe, because now the church is actually being called upon to participate in holy spiritual violence in the culture that we're in right now. As Billy said earlier, this is a difficult place. It's a difficult space to be in on, on how to communicate effectively. The church's vocabulary, unfortunately, has been co-opted by media and politics. But can, can I tell you, it was the church's vocabulary first. When we speak of freedom and justice and all these words, these are words that are scriptural. They're not political. They are for us. And we as the body of Christ, we have the opportunity and the responsibility not to be the thermometer in the culture that registers the temperature. We're called to be the thermostat. We're called to be the people of God that, that, that speak in to these arenas. We address the what's. We address the what's. We're against sin, aren't we? We're against the murder of police officers. We're against crime. We're against looting. We're against all these things. We are against these things. We're against the what's. But we always have to remember, when we see the what's, it begins to clue us in. And we need to know when we're seeing these things in our culture, what we are not just calling out the sin that we see with our eyes, but we're also calling out the sin that what we see with our eyes is opening our eyes to see something else. It's called systemic racism in our culture. And we need to be willing to open our eyes and to see what is really going on and stand against it in the name of Jesus. It is a moral issue. It is the what question. But we as the body of Christ, we don't just address the what. We address the why. We address why sin exists. Because, because, because of sin, and the only person that deals with sin is Jesus. That's why when we speak out in these issues, we don't just address the what. We have to bring people to the why, which is sin, and we point people right to the cross of where it's dealt with. That's the unique message of the church of Jesus Christ. And I will tell you, in the moment that we're in, and we talked about this on Wednesday night. If you didn't get a chance to watch the Wednesday night virtual service, I encourage you to do so. Um, we had Josh and Hazen on and just had a great conversation around these, these matters. And we need, to, we need to get this, guys. We need, to get, we need to get the systemic racism that exists within our culture and not turn a blind eye to that. Let me speak this just for a moment because this is the spiritual violence we need to do. We need to go after this thing in a heartfelt and meaningful way. I believe it's going to be accomplished with two things, education and revelation. Education and revelation. We need to find out what's really happening in our country. We need to know what our history is. I don't mean just hundreds and hundreds of years ago. I mean as early when I was a child in my own parents' generation when they were growing up and they're still alive. The things that were happening in this country. We need to educate ourselves. I encourage you, if you haven't, go to the Civil Rights Museum in downtown Atlanta. Get in the car. Go to the Lynching Museum in Montgomery, Alabama. Let's educate ourselves. Let's find out the truths of these things that are going on. Let's find out what is happening and really get involved. I want to introduce you to somebody real quick. Uh, Joel, he's in the house, right? Where's Joel? Come here, Joel. Run down real quick. He, he didn't really see this coming, but I want, you to, I want you to see Joel for a second. You're going to immediately, when you see Joel, you're going to know he's my son. We look, we are so similar. Can, can't you tell? This is, my, this is my son. We look a lot like our father, don't you think? We look so much like. We have the exact same dad. We both bear the image of God. Joel is my son. He moved in with us three years ago and just, just has become and is our son. And when you know what, he has been the source of education for me. Because one of the things that I don't experience that Joel does is what it's like to go on a jog at night wearing a hoodie. Not once have I ever walked on a sidewalk or down the road and ever worried a little bit. But as I've seen Joel's heart, he thinks about that. He feels that when he walks in. Let me just tell you, when I say education, I mean more than a book or more than a trip to a museum. I mean, get to know people like him. That he, that's, you know, wearing his beautiful black ebony outfit. <laughs> I'm telling you, get to know. And, and don't just ask 
the superficial questions. What was the turning point in my life was having significant conversations with my African brothers and sisters. Now, I realize you might be thinking, well, what about the Asians and the, uh, and the American Indians? I realize there's atrocities across the board, but the moment we're in right now needs to be very directional toward our African American brothers and sisters that are going through this moment, and it will help you so much. I love him. He is my, he is my son. He is my son, and that's how we have it. I love you. I love you. Oh, love you. That's when I say it. Thank you, Joel. We talk about educating ourselves. We do spiritual violence not by inactivity. We do it by proactive activity, by educating ourselves, finding out things. But it's not just education alone. We need revelation. We need to catch the heart and the mind of God when it comes to these matters and find out from the Holy Spirit. Humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Become a teachable person and learn. Even if you think these issues don't make any sense to you, listen, just humble yourselves and be teachable. Recognize if you were like me, you went to high school and middle school, and my history book maybe had two pages devoted to the whole subject of what's happened to the African-American community and our culture, that 86% of American history, 86% of our history, get that, 86% of the history of the founding of this country, the colonists arriving in this, in this place, our African-American brothers and sisters have been under actual legislative oppression for 86% of that time. Now let that just settle in. We need to educate ourselves. We need the revelation of the Holy Spirit. And we need to direct our hearts in compassion and direct people to the cross of Jesus Christ. Because guess what? We know this. Unless we do reconciliation first with God, there can be no reconciliation with each other. Unless we learn to love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we're never going to be able to love that way horizontally. We bring people to the cross, and at the cross is where we see change. The most spiritually violent act in human history when a man by the name of Jesus Christ was nailed on a cross. When God himself became flesh and subjected himself to that kind of treatment. Can I tell you, that is divine activity as Naomi pr pr um, prayed in the flesh, and we're called to do the same and likewise. Amen? All right. So we, I want to encourage you, if you haven't read the notes, you can go to uh, mynewbridge.church, and you can find out the notes, and you can pick up right there, mynewbridge.church. You, you don't have to scroll these things down. So we begin talking about this, this passage a couple of weeks ago down in Matthew Verse 12 of chapter 11 that says this, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and violent men take it by force. Let's pray. Father, for these next 30 minutes, Holy Spirit, help us, help us, Holy Spirit. I'm convinced, oh God, that we just don't need another sermon. We don't need a pontification of a hermeneutical, homiletical, eschatological, ecclesiological fountain. God, we need you, Holy Spirit. We need your words are spirit and they are life. So God, help me. Lord, help me, Lord, to be, God, some voice today, Lord, for your truth through revelation. Hit all of our hearts and mine included. Help us to see. We don't want to be the people of old Jesus that when you, would, when you would levy the accusation, they were ever hearing but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. They were ever hearing but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Lord, let that not be said of us. Let that not be said of us. Open our eyes that we can see. Open our ears that we can hear. And be transformed, God, through revelation and then set obedience to that revelation that would lead to the transformation that we need so much in Jesus' name. Amen. So we talk about spiritual violence. We talked about this kind of as a hard passage, and I won't re-speak the message from a couple weeks ago. But basically what you're seeing here is a juxtaposition between two different realities. One, we see religion. One, we see religion. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And we find out what religion seeks to do. And we, and we uh, find out the accusations of the hardest words Jesus ever spoke in Luke chapter 11 when he begins to give the woes to the Pharisees. Remember that chapter? If you think Jesus is this real simple, low-key, non-confrontational dude walking around petting the little lambs, read Luke chapter 11. 
and you're going to see a side of Jesus. You're going to see a righteous indignation of the Son of God speaking right in to the spirit of religion that exemplified itself of that day. And what he did was he accused them of actually shutting the door of the kingdom of God in people's faces and preventing them from entering in because they themselves had not entered into it. Strong words that religion does. And that's a, that's a great message, not for today. We're focused on the other aspect of that. The other aspect of that speaks to this, that there is a spiritual violence that should be resident in every believer, a grace-filled zeal fueled by a hunger and thirst for righteousness that's pursuing God. I mean, it is not a defensive posture. It is actually an offensive posture. I am so convinced that this is not a moment, nor it has it ever been a moment, for the church of Jesus Christ to play it safe. We are not called to play it safe. We are not called to hide out on a planet in our spiritual foxholes waiting on Jesus to come rescue us. We are called to this place to pray your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we actually have an assignment unto that end. You hear me? So there are different theological camps based on that. And I don't know how much work we can get done before Jesus comes back. I will acquiesce. I don't know. He is coming back, but I know we have something to do in the meantime. There's those that believe, well, it's it's just all going to hell in a handbasket anyway, so let's just sit and do nothing. Let's move to Idaho and just hide up there. They'll find you in Idaho. That's not going to work. And then there's my brothers and sisters that believe that the, that the, uh, that the church is actually going to Christianize the entire planet before Jesus comes back. And we have all belief systems in between. So, you know, wherever you put yourself on the timeline, wherever you put yourself theologically, I can't fix all that for you. I have my thoughts on that. We have our thoughts here. But I can tell you this, it doesn't negate our responsibility. We're not called to play it safe. We are called to preach the gospel that has profound issues of justice and righteousness into the moral conscience of whatever nation we find ourselves in. And we point people to the cross. And yes, my friends, that may cost us our life. It may cost us our said freedoms in this place. But it's okay because we have no expectation that our best life is going to be now anyway, do we? Our best life isn't now. Our best life is there. Be a great title for a book, wouldn't it? Your best life there. I could almost, I could, I love that. Your best life there. That's what we understand. That's what this spiritual violence pushes us into. And we talked last week, but this prevents us from accommodating, stumbling, and sinning in the body of Christ because we have this hunger and thirst for righteousness. But it's, a, but it's a truth. The truth is that we don't have to do this all by ourselves. We do it standing in the grace of God. We talked about Galatians 5.1, that it was for freedom, what? That Christ set us free. How many of you have been set free by Jesus? Thank you. You set me free, right? He set me free, but the verse doesn't stop there. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, what? Keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a a yoke of slavery. It means that I, too, have a responsibility in this. It's a work that Jesus did. Now it's a work that I need to do and stand firm and don't go back into sin. You see, we have a God who is able and willing to keep us from stumbling. He is a God who is able and understands to the high priestly Jesus that we love and serve, that understands that we are weak and when we are tempted, he will not let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. But when we are tempted, what does the word say? That he will provide a way of what? Escape. But the only way to access a way of escape is you have to be looking for it. I'm afraid that many who are caught in lifestyles of of sin and habitual sins, they so caved into it, so succumbed, realizing that freedom is not possible, we don't even look for a way of escape anymore. There is a way of escape for those who choose to see it and access it by grace. There must be a spiritual violence inside of us that doesn't accept status quo as normative that doesn't accept yielding to temptation as normative, and that's just how it is. 
there must be something, or I should say someone inside of us that is saying the spirit and the bride say, come. There must be someone inside of us that's saying, no, don't do that. I'm giving you the power not to do that. And it's the Holy Spirit. He is inside of us. You know his name is not just spirit, it's Holy Spirit. Because he wants us holy. And he cares about that. And it takes a spiritual violence to do that. Now I will tell you early on, early on in my walk with the Lord, and I said this a couple of weeks ago, I learned how to do and perform really well, but I didn't know much about love. I was still operating much out of my own strength to achieve certain levels of holiness and adequacy so I could prove it to God and prove it to myself. And that will mess your your journey up. It messed mine up for years and years and years. Because the truth is, our standing firm effectively is completely dependent on the grace of God, not fleshly willpower. I promise you, willpower will not get you there. Willpower can bring about some pretty interesting and powerful behavior modification, but it'll never yield to true transformation. You may get one thing kicked, but you'll default to something else just as quick. We've all seen that, right? We've all seen the people that were able to quit smoking, praise God, and then they gained 300 pounds the next month. What happened? Because we can achieve behavior modification, but we cannot achieve transformation, a part of the work of the Holy Spirit and grace in our life. And the good news is that you and I, we don't have to strive to get there. We don't have to strive to get there. I knew more about the power of God and not the personal love of the Father for the majority of my Christian life. I knew more about his power unto performance than I did his love unto peace. Peace with God. And that's the gift that he's given us. And I hope that's the gift. We see a a, a passage and I'll illustrate this for you really quickly. In, um, in um, Ezekiel chapter 2, I love this. We talked about it two weeks ago, but it bears repeating. Ezekiel the prophet, God says to him, Son of man, stand on your feet that I may speak with you. Many of us stop right there and never read verse 2. We immediately try to stand up on our own. We try to figure out how to do it. We try to get a plan. But the verse goes on. The very one who spoke to Ezekiel to stand up is the very one who does this. And he spoke to me, the spirit entered me and set me on my feet and I heard him speaking to me. You see that? That's biblical standing right there. When the Bible says that we're called to stand firm and not be yoked again to a slavery to sin, he is calling us to stand firm because the Holy Spirit is standing up inside of us. It's never us. It is us, but it's not us. It's grace inside of us as Ezekiel learned this. Now, I want to expose all of our tendency toward performance. Anybody room have a tendency toward performance? Yes, we all have a tendency toward performance. Very familiar passage, John chapter 21. I want to read this to you. Very familiar passage. Jesus has been crucified. He has risen from the dead. He's in the period of the 40 days of appearing to various ones. John 21, verse 1. After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And he manifested himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathanael of Cana and Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will also come with you. They went out and got into a boat, and that night, look at this, they caught nothing. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, children, you do not have any fish, do you? They answered, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find a catch. So they cast, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Therefore, the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on, for it was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards away, dragging the net full of fish. So when they got out on the land, 
they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. You know, I knew this story so well. I've read it many times, I guess, over the years. But it was at the beginning of 2019, after an incredible encounter with the love of God, I began to read this passage in a completely different way. And I want to share that with you. You know, when you look at this story, it was so right, but yet it was so wrong in so many ways. Look at this. Did you notice this? They were actually doing what they were supposed to do. They were doing what they supposed to do. They were fishermen. What do fishermen do? They fish. They were actually doing what they were supposed to do. They were fishing. They had said yes to their calling. They had said yes to their vocation. They had said yes to that. Well, not only were they saying yes to doing the right thing, they were equipped with what they needed. They had boats and nets, bait. They had everything they needed. They had had all the provision they needed to do what they needed to do. They had said yes to their equipment. So they said yes to their calling, yes to their vocation. They said yes to their equipment, everything they had. And guess what? They were actually where they were supposed to be. You don't go fishing on land. Where were they? They were out on the lake. They were, out, they were where they were supposed to be. They had said yes to their location. Not only that, they were actually with the right people. They weren't with ungodly folks and weren't on partying. They were with the right people. Peter and Thomas and Nathaniel and the other disciples in the second boat. So they had said yes to their community. So all the boxes were checked. Every box was checked, but guess what? How many fish did they catch? Zero. They caught zero. Jesus had them catch 153 big ones, but on their own, they caught zero. You see, it is very possible, guys. It is very possible and probable for us to have lots of activity and get nothing of real significance done. Have you ever lived like that? Have you ever experienced a season in your life where you were tired and you were weary and the fruit on the vine seemed painfully small? And you're scratching your head wondering, God, why? No doubt they were feeling the exact same way. Man, I know, I know what it's like to live like that. I know when God called me at 14 years old in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, I remember coming back from that trip so fired up, having having having, having experienced just the the power of God. And and I would serve God through my years in high school. And I would meet my wife in Brazil. We would come back, get married. I was 18. She was 21. Man, we were just ready to serve Jesus for the rest of our life, to be on the mission field. And and we we began the journey, the educational track and preparation. We began working, 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 and just hitting our head up against the pavement in so many ways, trying to figure out, God, why, where are you? Why is this so hard? Why is this so difficult? Why are we getting so tired and struggling so much internally? But man, I was determined, we're going to do this for Jesus if it kills me. And man, I, I, I had checked every box I mean, listen, I'm the perfectionist guy, man. Every T was crossed and, you know, I was dotted. I had the punctuation right, the grammar right. And yet, God, what happens? And then I thought the day came when, you know, God began to do something and, you know, called us back home to Decula, Georgia to plant a church. I said, oh, finally, here it is. Praise God. I'm finally getting out of the wilderness into the promised land. But once again, I still had that same mentality. And man, I, I had this set of expectations that I had put on myself and I had, and I had received from others. And I worked and worked and worked and worked and worked trying to build the church for the glory of God, the irony of it all, for the glory of God. And I remember during so many years of, the, of, the, of those days, God was so good and did so many great things, but I felt like inside I, something was dying and shriveling up inside of me. I would read the verses in the Bible That says, you shall mount up on the wings of eagles. You will run and not grow weary. You will walk and not grow faint. But I'm telling you, I was weary 
and I was faint. Can I tell you, brothers and sisters, if you are feeling weary and faint, that's the dashboard light. Pay attention to it. If you're in a season in your life and you are feeling weary and faint, and I'm not talking about hard work, you know what I'm talking about. When you're feeling the weariness and the faintness of soul, that is the light that needs to come on because the Holy Spirit is trying to tell you something. I realized I was doing so much in the arm of the flesh. Interesting little phrase that we find attributed to Sennacherib in 2 Chronicles that we can actually do things that are actually in the arm of the flesh and not in the Spirit of God. And it can feel right. It can feel virtuous. You can have every box checked, like I said, but yet you know something's not right in your soul because you're weary and you're tired and it's just not working. After this event in John 21, something cool happens. Jesus, they get really close to Jesus, and he invites them to come have breakfast on the Sea of Galilee. Remember now, Peter was the first one out of the boat trying to get to him. Peter had just experienced a powerful miracle and saw 153 fish caught in a very unlikely place close to shore. Big fish too, not the little ones like I catch, but I mean like the, like the, like the really big fish. And then he swam to Jesus and did, didn't just experience power, but he was about to have an encounter with grace. Remember, Peter had just failed in fishing, but just before that, he had failed Jesus personally by denying him three times. Yet Jesus was what? He was giving him a grace encounter on the beach in love. I was in Israel several years ago, and I remember specifically, you know, they don't know where everything is um, archaeologically over there because time wears away things. But, I mean, they still know where the Sea of Galilee is. That really hasn't gone anywhere. And they, and they really know where this took place. They're, they're with reasonable certainty where this little beach took place where they were fishing those fish. And I, when we arrived at that place, I just, there was something inside of me that I got to get to this place. And it was, it's not a big beach. It's not the Copacabana or Destin. It's just a little rocky beach, probably no longer than half the size of this room, maybe a bit longer. And I got all by myself, and I remember I just knelt down. I just knelt down. And I said, God, Jesus, have that conversation with me. And I remember feeling the presence of God in that moment, feeling the presence of God. Lord, let me experience your grace like that. Father, I feel like such a failure. I feel I've checked every box. I know everything I'm supposed to do, but yet, Lord, I feel like such a failure. And just the warmth and the, and the love of God began to flow over me. And, and it was just kind of level one of really what I needed. But I knew I felt something significant. And I reached down and I picked up this rock off of that beach in Israel. And I brought it back home with me. The very beach, right? The very beach where Peter had an encounter with the grace of God that would shift and alter his entire life. Out of his greatest failure, out of his great weakness, Jesus restored him. It was only when Peter was most attuned to his own weakness was he able to experience the manifest grace upon his life and then turn to feed the sheep and to live his life as a testimony to the glory of God and would ultimately one day be crucified upside down. Something happened, didn't it? Peter got to the end of himself. He got to the place of weakness to experience it. I think for most of us, and, it, and at least it was true of me, because I don't tend to pay a lot of attention to the dashboard lights in my own car. Well, that's just a computer issue. It's just a fuse issue. It'll go off in a minute. Come on, you've done this, haven't you? Oh, this could be serious. And two days later, you turn it on, and the, and the light goes off. And it gives you a couple of weeks, and all of a sudden the light comes back on. Oh, it just must be a little flickering issue. Most of us are precariously close to real problems in our life because we're not watching the dashboard. All of us have a spiritual dashboard, and it feels like weariness and faintness. 
Because when we run, we grow weary. When we walk, we grow faint. Something is wrong. What God is doing for you and what God did for me, he said, all right, I'm going to give you your share of the inheritance. And you go out and just get to the very end of yourself, and I'll be there. I've been there all along, but there's something in you that just got to be worked itself out. For me, it took, you know, 23 years, but I got there. I reached that point, and then I was done. And then now God's like, okay, now we can talk. Because the very thing I want from you, son, is not your strength. I want your weakness. That's what I'm looking for. Because when you embrace your weakness, my strength will be perfected in it. When you embrace your weakness, I'm going to stand up inside of you. And we're going to get a whole lot more done that way anyway. That's what he's looking for. And the apostle Paul, he walks this out in such a way because he would boast in his weakness, not in his education, not in his pedigree, not in his list of accomplishments. Though they were many, he would reach the place in his own life where he would only boast in his weakness because he learned something. He learned a secret to the kingdom of God. And he tries to communicate that to us through God's word. And we'll end with this passage of scripture here. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. He's, he's writing to this church in Corinth. And he's reflecting back on how he came to them. And you got to know the historical context. Because before Paul went to Corinth, he went to Athens. You remember the story in Athens, right? Acts chapter 17. Paul sees there are great religious people. He points to what? I see you have a temple to an unknown God. And he begins to preach the gospel. And he begins to reason with the philosophers. He begins to engage them at a cerebral level. And it was powerful. And some great words are found in Acts chapter 17. But what we're left with is this. No real big church was established in Athens. Only a few people got saved. Now, I don't know this to be true, but my opinion is that I think Paul learned some lessons in Athens. And by the time he got to Corinth, he was not the same person that he was in Athens. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom. I got to think, maybe he said, oh, I tried that, it didn't work. Proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. I feel like when when Paul was coming out of the experience in Athens, he realized, listen, I'm not supposed to argue and debate all the time. I just don't need to know anything but Jesus and him crucified. That's what I preach. It is, the, it is the hope of the cross. And it says he just not, we always get lost and say, oh, I want the demonstration of the Spirit's power. How many of us, we all want that, don't we? Yes. Remember, I cut my teeth on that when I was 14. The power of God, the power of God. It was, it was all about the power of God. I was the disciple who was rejoicing more that the demons were subject to me than I was that my, lamb, my name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I was that guy. It was all about the power. Now, Paul says, I came in the demonstration of the Spirit's power, but something preceded the demonstration of the Spirit's power. It was, it was weakness. It was, it was fear. It was trembling. All of you go home right now, and you can adjust your LinkedIn profile. And when it says for qualifications, to just put weak, fearful, and shaky. See how many earthly jobs you're going to get. Here are my qualifications. I am weak and I'm afraid and I can't hold a pen straight. That's not going to get you many jobs probably on the planet. But what it will get you is the eyes of God. He's going to see that. He said, because that's exactly what I am looking for. And it was from that heart posture, that leaning into the grace of God, we find out, yes, Yes, Lord, this is what you've been looking for. What happened to Paul to bring him to that place? 
There were trials and hardships and sufferings. Yes, of course. But before all that, he had a strong encounter with the person of Jesus Christ. And you can read all about it in Acts chapter 9. He had an unfiltered, powerful encounter with Jesus that knocked him off his horse, left him blind and in bed for three days. And it would change his life. You know what we need, don't you? We need an encounter with Jesus. A true encounter with Jesus will bring us to that place and leaning right into him will bring us to the place of weakness, fear, and trembling. But we have to get out of the idea that these are not virtuous. They are so virtuous. And really quickly, what does weakness mean? What does weakness mean? I think in short it means this, that, 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 that it means that we bring nothing to the equation. We bring zero. He brings everything. I did for a long time. I'm sure I said on many occasions that I tell you what, I'll do my part and God will do his part. I'll bring my 10% and God will bring his 90%. I'll bring my 5%, God will bring his 95%. Or if I had, on a really good day when I was feeling good, I might be so bold to pray, oh God, I can, I can, get, I can get 60% today. Hallelujah. I feel so good. I got everything. All the boxes are checked. This is a 60% day. Have you ever days like that? Come on, you have, haven't you? This is a 60% day, so God, you're only going to have to contribute 40% today. But inevitably, Monday morning comes, and you're back down to 10% again. And we're always trying to access this, this thing in us that, that wants to perform. Because I'm not after that. I'm after you saying that you're bringing nothing. Because it's only in that place my grace can be fully maximized through you. That's what weakness says. I'm completely and utterly dependent upon the grace of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 10, Paul would declare this, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. Listen to this. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. So lest you think I'm going light on hard work, oh, don't hear me say that, please. Lest you think I'm saying laziness is acceptable, oh, no, I think hard work, we should work harder than anybody else on the planet. We should be in. We should give our, 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 our strength and our life to all of this. But it happens from the place of grace and power. Weakness simply is an, is an acknowledgement of that which is already true, isn't it? To live counter to that is just our own personal deception that we perpetuate. The truth is we really bring nothing to the table and we fool ourselves if we think we do. God just wants to get us to the place of truth, the real actual state of things. It's apart from him, I can do nothing. It's his breath in my lungs that enables me to breathe and do everything. Well, fear just simply means this quickly. Weakness, fear. Fear means this, that I hate what God hates and I love what God loves. To be in the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom, and wisdom says I must hate what he hates, I must love what he loves. You see, if I love what he loves, I'm going to hate what he hates. And this very truth, it's in the fear of the Lord, I must take a stand against racism and systemic racism. I do it because I know God hates it. And I hate it. If he hates it, I hate it. And I'm going to love who he loves. He loves. And because love is the motivating factor, that's what drives me. The great accusation in Luke chapter 11, Jesus speaking to the religious community. He wasn't even talking to the world. He was talking to the religious Pharisees. And, I, and rest assured, if you lived during that time and you were a conservative Jew, you would have probably gone to the first Pharisee church. You probably would have went there. That, that was the, they were the good guys, so to speak, back, then, back in that time. You would have went there. And yet Jesus Speaking to them in Luke eleven thirty two, 32, he says, you have neglected justice and you've neglected love. <laughs> We're called under the fear of God to take a stand, not because it's an issue, because we're motivated by love. The fear of God, the gain of wisdom. And the last is trembling. Trembling, what does it mean? 
you know, I, I, I think what it means to me, trembling, it, I, think it's, I think it's sobriety. You know, when you're doing something really important, you feel it? Ever gone to do something or speak or share something? You had that, like, inner tremble because you understand just how important it is. The meeting you're about to have, the email you're about to draft. Some of you are quite eloquent in sending textbooks, and, you know, and when you're trying to deal with something really, really important that has great consequences, there's a tremble inside of you. That's what it means. Yes, it is work, but not work sourced in our fleshly willpower, but a work of grace inside of us. And what works that grace inside of us is an encounter with the love of God. As we sang about it earlier, before he did anything, he was a lover. He was a lover. And it's an encounter with that love that will change us. You see, out of a place of grace and love, everything we do will proceed from peace and not performance. As long as we're performance-driven, you're going you're gonna to run and grow weary. You're going to walk and grow faint. That's where that leaves, that, that's what leaves you. I can, everything that I do, I am that I am because of the grace of God, because everything I do can come from a place of peace. Because in the cross, I'm fully reconciled with my Father. I am at peace, peace with God. And man, when you have that peace, that that experience from the Prince of Peace, it takes the teeth and the tyranny of performance. It just renders it useless because there's nothing left to lose and there's nothing left to prove. I am okay. I'm okay. Whether I'm preaching to thousands or I'm engaged in a conversation with a lady cutting my hair or whether I quit all this and walk away and go get a job digging ditches, I'm really okay because I got peace with God. Nothing left to prove to him or prove myself. And this is the place that we're called to be because the brilliance of the Father is this, and we say this around here, that a lover will outwork a worker every time. A lover will outwork a worker every time. We will give everything for love, wouldn't you? Love is it. A lover will always outwork a worker. This isn't a work issue. This is a love issue. The Lord's calling us, guys. In this season more than ever, we need to be rooted and grounded in the love of God. To be strengthened in the inner man. By that love. And maybe you're like me, I hope not, that you've gone many, many years serving Jesus and you know the dashboard lights are on. There's a, there's a weariness in your soul. There's a faintness in your step. And, and because of that, it, it perpetuates a stumbling and a lack of retention of the victory that you have in Jesus. Those are warning lights. It should tell us something. That we're not in the grace of God. We're not experiencing him to the, to the fullest measure. And he's inviting us to come. Even in the midst of the enemies of your life, the greatest challenges, he's put a table right in the presence of all love. Isn't that great? He puts a, a table right in the presence of your enemies. Right in the midst of it. His grace. He anoints your head with oil. Your cup overflows right in this place. And then you actually get okay. Can I tell you? It's a place. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, actually a real place. Being okay. Don't you want to be okay? We all want to be okay. It's only when we get that peace of God that we actually finally get okay. Let's just pray. Father, help us, Jesus. Jesus. Lord, some of us, some of us, Lord, we've, we've checked every box. We've, Lord, we've, we've tried to adhere to everything you've called us to do. We've tried to keep our stumbling minimized, but yet, Lord, there's a, there's a faintness in us. There's a weariness in us. And yet you call us to don't grow weary in well-doing, but, Lord, in my well-doing, I've grown weary. We ask ourselves, Why? 
and you're right there. You're right there. You're inviting us close to shore. To get closer to you. Not just, listen to this. Some of us get so close to the shore and we experience the power of God and we, and we catch the fish and we get so enamored by that, we miss the invitation to come to breakfast with Jesus. We get wrapped up in that and we, and we miss the greater thing. The greater thing was not the 153 fish. The greatest thing was sitting around the campfire with Jesus. In our moment of utter failure, I failed to fish. I can't even, I can't even fish anymore. And I've just denied you, Jesus, and here I am. You're, you're, you're forgiving me, and you're, and you're loving me. You're letting me experience your grace. Listen, you can get so close and never make it to breakfast. That's what I'm here to tell you. You can get so close, but then you can miss the very thing that's the most beautiful. And he's inviting you to breakfast. He's inviting you into the place of just weakness and, and fear and trembling and let him get your heart. So no matter where you are right now, whether you're watching now or watching later, or whether you're in the building, I'm asking you, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. We need you, Holy Spirit. Only you, Holy Spirit, can take us to Jesus. Only you can remind us what he said. Only you can teach us these things. Could you just pray that just in your own way? Help me, Holy Spirit. Take me to Jesus. Jesus, take me to the Father. Oh, God, I need you. I need you. I am asking you, Father, for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I am asking you, God, for a personal Pentecost that would result in a passionate spiritual violence, born in the grace of God, filled with love, not in performance, but in peace. That would typify those New Testament believers and so many throughout history that you brought revival and you brought us right back. To our first love, which is you. So just put your hands right there on your heart. Say, Father, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Bring me into a place of encounter. I lay aside all the strings that I've attached. Well, I just want you, whatever it takes. Lord, if it's dancing, undignified in my FI, Lord, I'll do it. Well, I just want you. The times are serious. Now is the time, brothers and sisters, that we need to be trembling. The hour is late. Jesus is coming. We don't know when, but he's coming. The stakes are high. The consequences are real. The clarion call of the voice of one crying in a wilderness is once again in the land to be forerunners in this hour. to open our mouth and let him fill it. The spirit of prophecy filling our mouths. Let that tremble. We need it. We need the tremble. We need the responsibility. Prophets of old speaking to kings and nations. We need that collective voice. Maybe not manifested in a single individual prophet, but in the collective prophetic voice of the bride of Christ that stands unified. Holy Spirit, we need you. We need that tremble. We need the fear of the Lord. We need to hate what you hate and love what you love. We need weakness. We confess. Just confess it, Lord, I'm zero. Just say, I'm zero. This doesn't make you less. This makes you more. I am that I am because of the grace of God. Come, Holy Spirit, help us. We worship you. We bless you. The strong and great name of Jesus. Thank you, Father.